All right, everyone, I have two o'clock. And so we're going to dive into score the shore. And as you may have noticed, if you've been with us all day long, we try and rotate through and give you different people on our team to listen to for most of these um, parameters. So you're, you're with me this time. Um, so first, a quick refresher on where we are in the agenda. We are at score the shore, which is our two o'clock training session, which will take us to about three o'clock. Um, we have a break from three to 315. And then we'll end the day at 3.15 with Eric and I um, running through the training for Exotic Aquatic Plant Watch. As always, throw your questions in the chat if you have any. So this is our score of the shore um, parameter. Score of the shore is the newest parameter in the Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program. And it was added to the program um, specifically um, due to feedback from our volunteers. We were interested in exploring um, potential new parameters to add to the Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program. And we had a, a number of opportunities for our current volunteers to give us input on what they would like to learn more about on their lake. And overwhelmingly, people uh, participating in the CLMP wanted to know more about how to assess the health of their shoreline habitat around the lake. There's been a lot of um, really good um, research and education and information coming out about the importance of healthy shorelines for healthy lakes and um, some of the studies of lakes around the country and particularly in Michigan um, found that one of the biggest stressors um, impacting our lakes was the um, degradation of our shorelines through development and, and other things and making them unnatural and therefore unhealthy for the lake. So we developed this protocol specifically to address that um, interest of our volunteers in knowing more about shorelines. So just like we've been talking a little bit about um, uh, potential salinity parameter in the future or other ideas that you have for things you'd like to learn about your lake. We're always open to that kind of feedback because it may result in a new parameter like it resulted in Score the Shore. My name is Joe Lattimore. I uh, introduced myself uh, this morning first thing, but uh, for those of you who are just joining us now, um, I'm a faculty member in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Michigan State University. And I also serve as the director for my core. Um, I've been involved um, since my core itself was, was formed um, almost, almost two decades ago. And um, it's, it's exciting to continue to be here and watch the program continue to grow. And it's always a lot of fun to work with all the dedicated volunteers here. So um, I'm excited to, to share more about Score of the Shore with you this afternoon. So a lot of this presentation is going to be show and tell. Um, we've got a lot of pictures to show you of different examples of conditions on along lake shorelines um, that will help you um, with your assessment of shoreline um, health or lack thereof on your lakes. Um, we know in, uh, conclusively that healthy shorelines are valuable and important because they provide habitat. Habitat for fish and birds, amphibians, other animals, um, and also a lot of really uh, valuable plants and some unusual and rare plant species even. Um, healthy shorelines also help maintain water quality. They limit erosion into your lake and they slow rain runoff. Um, they also look really nice, right? Um, it's one of those things we picture when we think about a healthy lake. I think about the, the lake behind me in my, in my uh, uh, Zoom window here has a natural shoreline and it's what we think about when we think about a natural, beautiful lake. However, our shorelines are threatened. Um, and I bet you a lot of us have seen examples of threatened shorelines. Um, development that we do when we want to live close to the lake or we want to recreate along the lake shore, um, it often eliminates important components of a healthy shoreline, like lawns and adding rock and seawalls. Those will remove optimal habitat locations. Um, and then our use of the shoreline, like foot traffic and using docks and installing docks and the desire for an unobstructed view of the lake leads to the removal of vegetation. And then we see erosion and we see degradation of the shoreline. Now this image here shows you a, a shoreline that's um, kind of zoomed in looking at some specific examples. But I also wanna show you some examples um, on a larger scale. I've got some time-lapse photos that were provided by the state of Michigan um, that show uh, kind of the change of natural shoreline back in the 30s to develop shoreline. And this is from the, the Yankee Springs area in um, Southern Michigan. So take a look at this um, aerial photograph. You can see um, the shoreline here 
going along here. It's all very natural and undeveloped. You see some farms over here, but nothing right along the lake shore. And then as we see going up to 2014, you can see some pretty big differences there, right? First of all, there's development all along the shoreline, houses and roads, lots of docks you can see in there, especially right in here. Also, there's a whole system of canals that didn't exist before that are adding more kind of movement of material, like potentially erosion, soil, pollutants, and so forth off the landscape into those canals and into the water. I'll show another example here. Um, again, 1938, look at that natural shoreline there. You can see some wetland areas, low areas. Here's kind of a stream running through here. And then let's go to 2014. Pretty amazing, right? <laughs> All of these channels were built, um, you know, trying to build as much waterfront property as possible. And of course, we love being on the water. We enjoy being on the water. And so it's not surprising that we develop our shorelines, but how we develop them is really important. I think I have one more example here. Again, historic shoreline development, 1938. And you can see there's some homes along there and you can see some docks. This was already uh, somewhat developed. Now let's go ahead to a modern time. Again, lots of development, houses lined up, um, you know, turned sideways and lengthwise so we can pack as many in as possible <laughs> along here. Um, and you can also see seawalls, see how neat that shoreline is going through there. Um, that's all been, you know, built into seawalls and, and kept from, you know, it may prevent some erosion, but it certainly eliminated any natural habitat that might be there. So those tell a story, the pictures definitely tell a story, but you know, we're all about monitoring here with the Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program. And that means collecting data, having numbers about um, all of the different parameters that we are interested in. So that's why de we developed Score the Shore. And Score the Shore is a standardized approach that'll help you assess the health of your lake shoreline. It'll help you identify high quality areas to protect and also to discover opportunities for improvement and restoration. Um, and one of the um, uh, nice things about this program and also Exotic Plant Watch, which we'll talk about next, is that enrollment is still open and will be open for Score of the Shore and Exotic Plant Watch throughout the summer. So if you decide later on that you wanna add this um, to your monitoring um, activities this summer, um, you can enroll all the way up to August 31st. So um, that's, and it's available to all of our volunteers, whether you have any experience in the program or not. So this is a really good kind of um, entry level program. And it also gives you information that you can use right away. So that's something I'm really excited about, about Score the Shore and Exotic Plant Watch, is that once you do it once, you have enough information to actually make some management action, either on your own property or within your community, because you'll know the status of, your, of the shoreline or of your invasive species in Exotic Plant Watch. Um, that's in a little bit different to the water chemistry measurements that we make, where it really is useful to have a few years worth of data before you really can look for trends. Um, the immediate information you get from Score of the Shore can be useful right away. So when we talk about what good is this information, it's good for you locally in your community, like if you have a lake association or within your lake community, your township and so forth, because it can help support educational efforts. You can immediately share the results of Score of the Shore with your neighbors, with local decision makers, with your community to point out, as I said before, where you're doing really well and where your score is lower and might, you might have some opportunities to improve. It can also inform your planning for the future. How do you wanna protect your lake shoreline moving forward? Some communities do that with zoning. Um, some do that with voluntary actions like not mowing along the shoreline for a certain number of feet from, from the water's edge, for example. There's a lot of ways to plan for the future to protect or improve the shoreline conditions that you have. It's also really useful information regionally and at the state level. It helps us get a better handle on the health of Michigan's lakeshores across the state to identify opportunities for projects, research, improvements, um, restoration projects, protection projects. Um, it supports research and it supports um, reporting to the federal level and also across the state on how well we're doing in managing and protecting our, um, our healthy lakeshores in Michigan. 
there's a couple of really um, good resources out there um, if you're interested in learning more about shorelines. Um, and I want to share a couple of those before we dive into the procedure for doing score the shore. Um, a couple of websites first. Um, the Michigan Shoreline Partnership.org um, has a wealth of information about um, the benefits of natural shorelines and how you can have a natural shoreline on your property and on your lake. So definitely check that out. Um, they have a lot of informational materials and also support a training program um, for certified natural shoreline professionals. That's um, very popular with landscapers and other service providers that want to be able to provide natural shoreline um, services to, um, to property owners along water. Um, the Michigan Shoreland Stewards Program is also a great resource for you. This um, is, includes a online questionnaire that you fill out about your own property. It asks you a series of questions about your own waterfront property that you can answer. And um, it gives you advice as you go through the survey uh, based on your answers, gives you suggestions on things you could do differently, or maybe just congratulates you on doing a great job. Um, and at the end, if you're doing a good job, you can actually qualify to be recognized as a shoreland steward and get a really cool sign that you can post on your property showing that you are a Michigan shoreland steward. Um, and then the final resource that I'll point out to you is a relatively new uh, publication called Shoreline Living. Um, and this is available at midwestglaciallakes.org. Um, we can also, um, there's information on there uh, where you can download electronic versions. Um, we can also provide hard copies of this for you if you're interested. And this was developed because we realized there's a few different kinds of people out there, right? There's some people who, as soon as they hear about natural shorelines, they're all in. They wanna learn everything they can do about it. It sounds really cool. They wanna protect the environment. They'll do anything that they can learn um, on their shoreline. But there's a lot of people that are like, but wait, I wanna have the view of the lake. I wanna have my lawn. I wanna be able to get my boat in and out. I want my grandkids to be able to play on a, on a beach that I make. Um, and so, just letting it look all, as they might say, weedy is not what sounds good to them. And so we develop Shoreline Living as a um, piece that shows just how beautiful and enjoyable um, natural shorelines are to live with. So it's not a technical guide. It's more of a beautiful magazine that will remind you of something like Better Homes and Gardens or Martha Stewart magazines that show you, you know, just how nice these can be. And a lot of different examples from super natural to something like this photo on the cover, which has some, you know, some lawns, some nice walkways, but also some deep rooted tall growing plants that help protect habitat. So check out those resources if you're interested in le learning more. All right. Let's jump into the actual process of conducting score of the shore. So in a nutshell, what, what is done is that a, a small team of folks will get on a boat and troll around the edge of the lake to assess the health of the shoreline using a scoring form that we provide you. And we ask you to divide the shoreline into thousand foot sections. So each of these blue or yellow sections is approximately a thousand feet. It doesn't have to be super exact. Um, and you'll calculate a score for each of those sections. It's not for an, any individual property. You're not gonna pick on one of your neighbors or anything. It's for these sections that are a thousand feet long and you'll have a score for each of those. And then you can calculate an average score for your entire lake. And as I mentioned, this information is really useful for sharing with others. It's a really valuable educational tool um, you can share the results and give tips on how lake residents can improve their scores. And it's important to point out the results of this are not regulatory. Um, these aren't intended to be enforcement for what people can or can't do on their property. It's to give ideas and show overall how the lake is doing and how people are doing um, and impacting those, those shorelines. So we recommend, you know, neighbor to neighbor conversations about the results. Maybe if your lake association or community has a newsletter, um, maybe write an article about what you learned through Score the Shore. Um, you know, share the information at a, at a lake association or neighborhood meeting. Um, there's a lot of ways to share this information that people will find really interesting. People immediately want to know how their part of the lake is doing as how it compares to the rest of the lake, for example. All right, let's prepare to actually score the shore. So if you sign up for score the shore, you'll have access to uh, paperwork. Um, it's all done on paper. There's no special equipment for this. 
Um, and that includes the, the written procedures guide, which is, is a really useful document, has a lot of details in it. And then data forms. There's a cover sheet that you only need one of, and that's where you'll just summarize um, the basic information about your survey. And we'll show an example of that in a minute. And then you'll have the section data form. Remember those thousand foot sections? You'll have one copy of that for every section of your lake. So on a large lake, you may have many pages. Um, and again, those are all on the CLMP documents page, or you can get them mailed to you um, by us. Now you do have to provide some equipment, like a boat. You have to do this from a boat, the way it's designed. Um, there's uh, things you'll have to describe that you're really only gonna be able to see from the water. So have your boat and your boating safety equipment, life jackets, all that kind of stuff. Have all your copies of your data forms, a copy of the procedure instructions to kind of walk you through. Um, it's got a lot of great examples in it and such. Um, bring pencils or waterproof pens to write on, clipboards will make life easier. A GPS unit of some kind is really useful um, because you can write down the coordinates of the beginning and end point of each of your section. That's really helpful for doing any kind of map you might wanna make. And if you decide to repeat the survey, maybe a few years down the road, you'll be able to do exactly the same sections again. But if you don't have that, you can identify landmarks um, to help you identify where you're at, the start and stop of each section. Cameras are really useful. Um, any kind of camera that you like using, digital of course is easiest because you can take lots and lots of pictures um, to document what you see. Um, binoculars are helpful because when you're out on the water, there might be some details on the shore that might be difficult to see um, and you might not be able to get very close in some places on your lake. And then tally counters. That's what I mean, those little clickers that you can count things with because um, you're gonna be asked to count things like buildings and docks. So those are helpful as well. All right, when should I do it and how much work is this gonna be? So we suggest doing it no earlier than mid-June. You really need to have full leaf out have all, your, all the plants on the shoreline be fully leafed out um, and that plants in the lake are also growing so you can see them well. Um, Northern lakes, of course, this might happen a little later than mid-June. How long it takes really depends on the size of your lake, of course. It depends on how many thousand foot sections of shorelines you have. So it might just take a couple hours if you're on a small lake, especially if you've done this before and you're familiar with it, but it's gonna take longer on a big lake. Um, I found going out with volunteers as we were developing this and doing side-by-side -side visits, um, it can take a half an hour to 45 minutes per thousand foot section once you're getting started. But once you and your team are pretty familiar with the data sheets and know what you're doing, 15, maybe 30 minutes on a thousand foot section. Maybe even, and if a, a section is very natural, like if you have a big natural area on your lake, those are really quick. You can do those in, in, a, in a very short amount of time, 15 minutes max. And we suggest repeating the survey every three to five years. Um, that's just a rule of thumb. You can do it as often as you want. If you wanna do it every year, you certainly can, and some lakes do, um, but it's really most useful um, at a little bit longer interval, unless there's a lot going on on your lake. Maybe there's a lot of development happening. A lot of people are putting in seawalls, or maybe it's the other way around. And a lot of people are, are switching to natural shorelines and you wanna document that. You can certainly do the survey more often. All right, now this is an important thing to do before you head out on the water. You're gonna to wanna to figure out where your shoreline sections are gonna start and stop ahead of time. Um, one way to do that is to use Google Maps or some other um, software. Um, you could also do it on paper um, to sketch out approximate thousand foot sections. Google Maps is kind of cool because it will actually measure distance for you. You can trace along the shoreline and it'll tell you when you've gotten to a thousand feet and you can make a little marker there and then do another thousand feet. But you don't have to do that. Just make sure that you set those up ahead of time. Um, otherwise you're gonna spend a lot of time when what you really wanna do is start doing the survey, just figuring out your thousand foot sections. So what I've found actually being on the lake with some groups, if they don't do this ahead of time, the group was spending more time arguing about where to start and stop than actually collecting data. So um, you'll wanna do that and then just number them sequentially. So we have like one, two, three, four, all the way around the lake to 12 on this, on this particular lake. It's also helpful then once you've done it, before you go to do your survey, hop on the boat and go in. And if you have a GPS unit, 
collect a GPS coordinates here at the beginning of section one, and again at the end of section one, which is also the beginning of section two, and collect those coordinates. So then when you're ready to collect your data, you can just go out and do it. Um, again, if you don't have GPS, you can use that process to identify shoreline landmarks. You might say, you know, red boathouse here, this one, there's a windmill. This one here is, you know, right at a driveway, things like that, that'll help you know that you're in the right spot. One key thing that you see on my slide there, it says don't use people's names for landmarks. Um, that happens a lot. We ask you not to do that on any of the data you submit to us, your data forms. You know, don't say Bob Smith's house, Jessica Michael's house, because if you do that, we have to go through and black out all of those identifying names. <laughs> and that can take a really long time. So we prefer that you not do that, use other descriptions or maybe a code that you know, but we don't wanna see the people's names or house numbers, that kind of thing, if you can avoid it. All right. Um, and again, as I said, other methods for, for setting up your map ahead of time, if you have different technology or ideas, that's fine. Just do it ahead of time. Trust me, you'll be happier if you do that. All right, um, pretty much the rest of the time is we're gonna talk about how to actually score the shore once you're ready to go out there. So the general process um, is what we recommend is you should have at least three people. One person who's driving the boat, because that takes a fair amount of work going back and forth across the sections, and at least two others that are actually doing the scoring. You might find a different process that works better for you, but this was developed from a lot of field testing with a lot of different groups of volunteers on the water, and this seemed to work best for people. We also recommend um, at least three passes along a thousand foot section. So first kind of go out a ways into the lake, about a hundred yards from the shore, and motor along and look at the um, details of the path of the shoreline, then get closer because there's some things we're gonna ask you to, to score that you can't really see unless you're in close and then go back out and do one more pass a little farther out and you'll see why in a minute. The team that's collecting the data should answer questions on every pass. Every member should get their own data sheet and there'll be things you don't agree upon. And so it's good to, you know, kind of spend time discussing if you think, you know, the answer should be this, no, it should be that, let's discuss it and reach consensus. And then one person will record the final answers. Then there's a little math um, to calculate the final scores. You can save that for when you get home um, and you'll see that here in a minute. All right, here's the survey cover sheet. This is the thing you only need one copy of and it just gives summary information. You'll see it looks very similar to a lot of the data sheets we have for the other parameters where you'll record the name of your lake and the county, township, um, the names of all the volunteers who participated, the dates you were out. Um, we also want you to make a couple comments about lake level. What was the lake level like when you were doing the survey? Was it average, was it low or was it high? Check one of those. Um, does your lake have a legal lake level? Yes or no? And if it does, indicate the level gauge reading at the time of the survey if possible. So if your lake is regulated to be at a certain level, there'll be a gauge and you'll be able to read, um, you should be able to see what that level is. And then comment here, did the lake level impact survey results? And if so, how? So if the water was really, really low or really, really high, are there some things maybe you couldn't see? For example, if the water is really high, maybe you couldn't actually see the edge of the normal shoreline. So make a note of that, but try and do it when the shoreline or the lake level is fairly normal. So that's the top half of the date cover sheet. Here's the bottom half. You'll answer a couple more questions. First of all, what's the total number of a thousand foot surveys that you, um, sections that you surveyed? So the example I gave before had 12. Um, and also you may find, as in most lakes, your last section is gonna be a little shorter than a thousand feet probably. It's not gonna come out even. So note it's approximate length here. If that last um, section was only about 500 feet, make a note of that here. Then also just check yes or no if uh, photographs were taken as part of your survey. Here's some math that you'll do. Um, and again, you can do a lot of this back at home after the survey. Record the total number of all the buildings or docks the total number of your sections and divide that to get an average number of structures per a thousand feet. And then here's where you'll add up your overall shore score, which you'll see um, a little bit later. 
Now here is where we look at the section, um, the section sheets, which you'll have one for every 1000 foot section. And this is the top half of that. So you'll write the section number, maybe you're starting at section number one. Um, so write one there, the name of your lake and the county and the date. Write down the GPS coordinates or the landmark at the start of the section. And now you're actually ready to start collecting some data. So you're going to count the number of homes and major buildings. You're also going to count the number of docks and boat lifts. Now remember, these are things that you can see from farther out on the water. You can be at 100 yards from shore or so, and you should be able to see buildings and, and docks from there. Then get in a little closer and go back by and look at some of these more fine details. For example, um, first we have um, characteristics of the littoral zone. And here's my very high tech diagram to remind us that the littoral zone is that shallow water area right here. You see the duck and that's how you know you're in the water. Um, and then there's the riparian zone, which we'll look at later, which is up on land near shore. So right now we're talking about the littoral zone right there in the shallows. Um, so you will um, first be asked about how much emergent and floating vegetation there is. And you'll put a check on one of these lines. Is there no emergent or floating vegetation? If so, you would put a check mark right here for none. Oops, let's go back. If there's less than 10% of that thousand foot section has emergent or floating vegetation, you'll put a check, check mark here. 10 to 25%, 25 to 75%, or greater than 75%. The number in parentheses is how many points you get for that answer. So if there's no vegetation, they're gonna get zero points. But if there's lots of vegetation, it's gonna get four points. More points is better. And you're gonna do the same thing for submerged vegetation. And we're gonna show you examples of all of these things um, with photographs here in a little bit. Um, is aquatic plant management evident or known? So do you know if like the weeds are being sprayed in that section? You could say no. You could say minor management, maybe just around docks and swim areas, or you could say major weed management. Maybe everything's being sprayed or maybe there's mats put down to smother all the plants there. You'll note the amount of downed trees and woody debris in the water. Again, it's none, few, one to five trees or logs, several or many. And then erosion along the shoreline. Again, none, minor, moderate, or severe. I'll show you examples of that here in a few slides. Now you're gonna go back out to being farther away from, from the shore again, because you're gonna look at some of the riparian characteristics up there on the land near shore. You're gonna look at what percentage of that thousand foot section has lawn, artificial beach, or impervious surfaces. What percentage of that section has an unmowed vegetation belt, which is any vegetation other than lawn? And how deep does that vegetation belt go? Is it only about a foot back from the water or does it go back 40 feet or more? Uh, a really nice thick buffer zone along the, along the shoreline. You'll also then, the last section that you'll uh, score for is shoreline erosion control. Um, what do you see along this thousand foot section? First, you'll look for vertical artificial, so seawalls. How much of that? What types are there? Are there seawalls? Are there rock walls or other? You'll then look for how much sloped artificial, and you'll see pictures of both of these here in a bit. Again, is it concrete? Is it riprap? So piles of rock or something else? And then finally, bioengineering. Do you see any kind of natural erosion control, like bundles of branches or core, coconut fiber logs, and we'll see pictures of those too. And then the last thing you need to do is just write down the GPS coordinates or the landmarks at the end of that section. And that's all you have to do. It actually goes pretty quick once you get used to what you're looking for. Um, and then that will be completed one for each thousand foot section. You'll have one of these sheets. The final scoring, you can do this back at home. Um, afterwards. And what that's going to do is allow you to add up all those points from the front, do some quick math. And what will happen is you'll end up with a score that's on a zero to a hundred scale. Cause that's easy to explain to somebody, right? Like if you can say, we got a hundred percent, you know, you did really well, but if you only got like 60%, you know, that might be close to failing. So it's just like a, a grade you would get on an exam. It's on a zero to a hundred point scale. All right. Now let's look at some pictures. Let's 
So what we're going to do now is look at examples of all of these things that I've been talking about on the data form. And one of the nice things that we did in the procedures for Score the Shore is we've included a lot of these photographs. So even on your hard copy, if you print out the procedures for Score the Shore, you can flip through and look at these photos. It's like, okay, yeah, I know that. That was what Joe was talking about during the training. So we're looking at photographic examples now. And again, remember, we're, when we fill out the data form, we're doing it on a thousand foot section of lake. A lot of the photos I'm gonna show you are zoomed in and maybe only show a single lot, just so it's easier for you to see what I'm talking about. But you're thinking about in terms of that whole thousand foot section where you're filling out the data sheet. All right, so one of the first things to do is to count how many homes and how many docks you can see. Um, and this is from the water, right? So for a rule of thumb, you know, I get the question a lot, especially about homes and buildings. Um, people will say, well, it's, there's a lot of trees. I know there's some homes back there, but I can't see them from my boat. If you can't see them, don't count them. We just want you to count the things that you can see. And the things that, same thing is true for docks. You know, do the best you can for counting them. And um, one of the rules of thumb, I know that some docks are complicated. Um, because they have a lot of different boat slips. They might be big, complex dock structures, almost looking like small marinas. And so the rule of thumb for that is count how many bar boat parking places you see. So, so some docks might actually have room for two boats, one on each side. You could count that as two in terms of the number of docks. All right, now we're making our way down the data sheets and um, the next category is about emergent and floating vegetation. And you'll see at the top of the screen, it's small, but I actually pulled the, the line off the scoring sheet, put it right there on the top of the slide so you know what it's referring to. So emergent and floating vegetation. What we mean by that is what we see here in the photo. Floating vegetation is things like lily pads, right? Things that are floating on the surface while emergent vegetation is things like these reeds that you see coming up out of the water, poking up. So what you'd be doing for this question is in terms of that thousand foot section, what percentage of it has emerging and or floating vegetation? And in this example, even though it's less than a thousand feet, it's pretty extensive. I would say it's hundred percent covered with um, floating and emerging vegetation. So that's what we're talking about there. Here's another example. We've got a lot of floating vegetation. Um, we have emergent vegetation. We've got some lily pads that are poking up right out of the water. That all counts. Um, here's another example um, that raised questions when we were testing this procedure. Here's a bunch of floating algae, uh, mats of algae that are floating on the surface. And yes, that counts too. Even if it doesn't have roots, this is floating vegetation. So you would consider that when doing your score. The next um, type of plants you'll be asked about is submerged vegetation. So submerged vegetation might come close to the surface and you might even see it poking a little flower up out of the surface. But um, I think most of you who have spent any time on lakes uh, are familiar with submerged vegetation. It's the stuff that grows 99% under the water. Um, and so this is the kind of thing you're looking for when you're ranking the amount of submerged vegetation. Here's another example. This is, um, it may also be far beneath the surface and just be like growing low against the lake bottom. You would also count that as submerged vegetation when you're looking at that thousand foot section. How much of that section has submerged vegetation? The next thing you're asked is, is aquatic plant management evident or known of? Um, and the options are no. As far as you know, no one's doing anything to manage the aquatic plants or minor means just in small areas, people might be managing um, around their docks or their swim areas or major. So an example here, we've got, you can see the, um, the bubbles coming up. Someone has a small bubbler in place. They're trying to kind of get some of that floating algae out of there. That's minor plant management. It's only effect, affecting a very small area of the lake. Um, here's a weed harvester. And if they're harvesting across that entire section, and you know they are, even if they're not doing it the day you're out doing your survey, you know it's happening. If it's, if it's across the whole section, this would be considered major management activity because that's clearing out all the plants along that section. 
Um, here's another example. Um, what we're seeing here in this photo is a technique called weed rollers. Um, they're attached on the lake bottom. You can see one right here and it spins. It rolls along in a circular area on the lake bottom, basically knocking back all the aquatic plants. Now, if there was in your thousand foot section, if we only saw evidence of maybe one, you could say that aquatic plant management was minor in this area. But if you look at this example, you can see they have moved this weed roller around and many of the neighbors have them. There's hardly any section of here, except for maybe right here and right here where they haven't used the weed roller to destroy the vegetation. And so in this case, I would call it major. All right, the next question is about woody debris or wood habitat that's in the lake. So uh, trees that have fallen in, roots, large branches that are in the lake, um, that kind of thing. It makes really good fish habitat and, and insect habitat. So we're very interested in that. So if uh, wood is fully submerged or if it's only partially submerged like this one right here, it still counts. Um, and if the lake is unusually low when you do your survey, if you see wood that is currently exposed but would normally be in the water, you can count that as well. Um, a rule of thumb for this, um, concentrate your counting of logs and trees on pieces that are three inches in diameter or larger. Don't worry about counting every twig in the lake, a little tiny bits of wood, but you know, actual you know, logs that are in the water, that's what you wanna be focusing on. And you simply have to estimate how many are in that thousand foot section and choose your answer accordingly. Here's another example of wood that has, you know, it's a tree that has fallen down. You can see that parts of it are in the water. Um, and, and so you would definitely wanna want to count that. And it also counts if they are trees that were placed there on purpose. It doesn't just have to be natural. Um, this is an example of wood that has been laid down into uh, the, the shoreline area in this littoral zone to provide habitat and erosion control. Absolutely count that too. You would count each of these trees or logs as a piece of woody material. Um, and as I mentioned, some of it may be counted there to um, uh, place there to stop erosion. And that's great. Count it here. Um, this is an example of a, of a property where they place some, some what we call root wads, root bundles here and logs to keep any kind of waves and stuff from, from hitting the shoreline and eroding it away. It kind of protects, provides some physical protection. So you'll count it here under woody debris. And then you're going to also count it later when we get to the erosion control section. So we're going to see this picture again. All right, moving down the sheet, we're now at the erosion assessment section. So in this section of the data sheet, you're asked to say whether, how much erosion do you see? None, minor, moderate, or severe. And I'll pause for a minute and I'll say, we know that those are very qualitative, vague categories, but that's okay. We want you to use your judgment and we know that not everyone's gonna agree on what's minor, what's moderate, but in, in the end, when we add all these data together and we look at them, they actually are a very good descriptor of how much erosion is happening in a lake. So, so don't, don't rack your brain too hard over that. I'm going to give you some examples of what I think is minor, moderate, and severe. Um, and then um, you can use those as a rule of thumb. So what I'm showing on the slide here is an area of small erosion. Um, and you want to include, like here you can see the, this is eroding away, some of these places where it looks like they've had um, boats or other things sitting on the grass, the grass has died, and now the, um, the roots are gone because it's dead, and so um, it's eroding away. Um, you want to include erosion that's clearly the result of human activity, like somebody's been tromping up and down the shoreline, dragging their boats in and out but also erosion that might be caused by forces of nature, like wind, waves, and ice. Um, you might not know what's causing it, and it doesn't matter just look for erosion. Um, this is a situation that's commonly seen. There's erosion all along the stretch of the lakeshore, but it's probably not severe because you don't have like a hillside that's about to fall into the lake. But I would definitely call this moderate because it's stretching a lot across a long stretch. Um, it appears that the property owner is concerned about it. You can see they've, they've shoved some rocks up in there to try and kind of slow down the erosion. So it's clearly happening, but it may not be as, as dramatic as what I would call severe erosion, where you're seeing big slumping happening along the shoreline. 
Um, here's another example of erosion that's pretty obvious, you know, and you might notice that what we see in common about these pictures is that it's just lawn grass and it's not, you know, it doesn't have enough roots to really hold um, the, the soils in place. So you see some moderate erosion happening there. You saw this picture already. In this case, we're seeing erosion actually coming down a hillside. Um, I'm not sure why this is happening, um, and, but again, it doesn't matter. If you're seeing soil kind of gullies eroding down, um, eventually if it rains, that mud is gonna wash its way right over that seawall. So that's an example of erosion as well. Um, this hill slope here is actively eroding. Um, for this small stretch, if this is what I was looking at across my 1,000 foot, I would say severe for sure. I mean, you can see that a big chunk of the hill has fallen into the lake. Here's clearly a tree has fallen off the hillside. They've cut it off here. But, you know, there's some major severe erosion happening in this case. Here's another photo of erosion that you may see. Um, this property seems to have no vegetation on the slope. It looks like bare soil, as you can see here. Um, it has the potential for serious erosion, but from this view, it's too far out for me to really know whether there's active erosion happening or not. I'd probably want to get a little closer to see, is there evidence of active erosion? Another question. Does a beach count as erosion? This question came out a lot as I was working with volunteers as we were forming this procedure. Um, and the answer is, it depends. And really it's only if there are active signs of the sand on the beach being lost to the lake. If your lake is naturally sandy, sand beaches may be a natural feature and shouldn't be considered erosion. It's just sand. That's what the soil is in that area. But we do often see where people have brought in sand, which is kind of what it looks like here. Um, you'd want to look and see if, if you could see evidence that the sand is washing out into the lake. Um, they've built a little wall here to contain it, so maybe it is contained. Um, but it also, the lake bottom from this photo, from what I can tell, looks awfully light colored up by the, uh, <laughs> by the shoreline here. So um, they possibly have lost sand into the lake. And if they have, then that's erosion. If they haven't, then no. All right, moving down the data sheet where you're going to be asked about kind of artificial land use along the, the lake shore in your thousand foot section. Here you're going to combine um, maintained lawn, maintained or artificial beach and impervious surfaces. So here's a really good example of maintained lawn. Obviously we all know what lawn looks like. And if this is the case along your whole thousand foot section, um, you know, you might check the greater than 75%. Um, you also can see some artificial erosion control happening here, but we're gonna talk about that more in a, in a few slides. Um, here in this example, we see maintained lawn as well as a small impervious walkway. Now the word impervious, the way we're talking about it here, it means that water can't soak through. So that means things like concrete, um, blocks, um, I've seen um, heavy stone application, things that just doesn't, water is not gonna be able to soak in. If it rains, it's gonna wash down that walkway and end up in the lake rather than soaking into the soil. So impervious means water cannot penetrate. So for this assessment, you're gonna, um, judge the percent of the section length that is lawn, artificial beach, and impervious all together because they all have kind of the same impact on the shoreline. Um, this is a really interesting example because you have a parking lot back here and then you have lawn that's maintained in modes. Um, and so you've got both. You've got impervious surface that's close to the shoreline and lawn. Um, so, yep, it's two out of the three. Here's some more impervious surface. Um, you know, you, you wouldn't count the mulch and mulched area along the shore because water can soak into that. But even though these are pavers and they do have cracks in between them, most water that hits this is probably going to wash off. So I would include that as impervious surface. This is definitely impervious. That's just concrete. Here's some maintained lawn and likely artificial beach. You'd have to take a peek and look at make it a decision if you think they're bringing sand in. Um, but yeah, we have, it's pretty much artificial through here. There's a little bit of, you can maybe see some more a natural lake vegetation here and here, but for the most part, you're looking at, at lawn and maybe artificial beach. Here's that shot again, um, maintain lawn and artificial beach. 
and we have artificial erosion control. And again, we're gonna get to that in a minute. All right, moving down, our next set of examples is that unmowed vegetation belt. Some people might call it a riparian buffer. Um, there's a lot of different words for it, but basically what we're talking about is what you're seeing right here, a strip of vegetation that's allowed to grow, that's gonna be taller than lawn, that probably has deeper roots that's left there that will help hold that shoreline in place. It also provides a lot of habitat benefits. So we're gonna look at good stuff here for a minute. Um, so there's two different characteristics you're gonna look at. One is looking along your thousand foot section, how much of that thousand feet has some kind of vegetation belt. No matter how narrow, this is kind of a narrow one or deep it goes. You're gonna to wanna to just look at that. Is there or isn't there an unmowed vegetation belt? The next thing you're gonna look at is how deep it is. So you can see this is just a few feet. Um, so this might go in the less than 10 feet category. All right. Um, so, you know, there appears to be some rock that's been placed here along the shoreline, um, and that's okay. And we can comment on that under the shoreline erosion control practices we're going to get to in a minute. Um, but you still would count the vegetation um, belt as existing. Here's another example. It's not a very deep belt, but it is there. Um, so it, it does exist. Um, it's only a couple feet in depth uh, here, less than 10 for sure, but it counts. Here's another example of that, um, a little different because you've got gravel and rocks mixed in there too. But really, if you take a look at this, it looks like there's lawn up here around this tree and up to the house, but the lawn doesn't really start until back here. So you have probably, I would guess, 20 to 30 feet of um, unmowed vegetation through here. So that's, that's what I would think about as far as the depth there. And here's a super natural shoreline. And if it goes back far enough, that you can't even see how deep the, the vegetation belt goes, just say greater than 40 feet. Um, even if it's half a mile, um, that's what you would count it as. This is an interesting example because you've got a little bit of everything. And remember, again, I'm showing you individual lots. You're going to be scoring an entire thousand foot section, but this just gives you an idea of some of the things we're seeing. So what we see here, we've got lawn going right to the water here, and then they have a very narrow vegetation belt right here and then a deeper one here and as you get farther back you can see it just continues into the forest over here so you've got a little bit of everything in that example all right now we're going to look at those different types of erosion control and you're going to score those so the first one we're going to talk about is maybe the most severe and that's the vertical artificial so straight up and down artificial structures that are there to stop erosion so the most classic one is a seawall. Um, so this is a great example of one. Um, this is, you see them made out of steel like this one. Um, here's a pretty extensive steel seawall. You may also find them made out of concrete or rock like this one. And if you have a section like this, that's you know not exactly straight up and down, but you've got large boulders or vertical walls made of rock, they're also considered vertical artificial structures. Um, and in fact, you'll notice in this picture that we have a boulder wall and that's in front of a concrete wall. So they've kind of double decker their vertical um, uh, erosion control here. And um, let me show you another example here. This one is also considered vertical. And see, this one's a little different because you might at first say, well, we also have a category for sloped artificial. But take a look at this. There's a couple of things I want to point out. First of all, we have a vertical seawall, it's right here. And then they've put large boulders in front of it. And those large boulders do have some slope to them, but it doesn't pass what I like to call the turtle test. If a turtle that's down in the lake has no chance of making it up onto dry land, call it vertical. It's just too big and too tall. There's no way that a, a lake resident like a turtle could make its way up onto land, say to lay eggs or something like that, and then back into the lake safely. So doesn't pass the turtle test, let's call it vertical. Um, here's another example. It's short, but it's pretty vertical. Um, I would probably still call this a, a vertical seawall. All right, now let's move on to more sloped examples. So riprap, um, sloped riprap uh, is what we're showing you here. It's often kind of jagged um, stones or concrete pieces. 
that are used uh, for a lot of erosion control. So it includes um, broken or smooth pieces of concrete, rock or smaller rocks. A turtle might struggle here too, but at least it has a bit of a chance. Um, and you can see that there's definitely an angle here. It's definitely sloped. So we would call this sloped artificial. Same thing here. Um, it isn't pretty, but it's sloped. Uh, a turtle could, could make it up here. So um, this would call a concrete sloped artificial erosion control. Um, here's another example of riprap. Um, it's a little hard to see from this angle. When you're out on the water moving around, it's probably easier to see, but this one did have some, some decent slope to it and the stones were small enough um, that it passed the turtle test, as does this one, more sloped artificial. And even a small amount counts. So, you know, even though it's just a low um, kind of row or two of stones here, that's still artificial erosion control. It has a slope, so that's what you would classify it as. And it, you would still count it if there's unmowed vegetation growing on top of a, or behind it. This is definitely erosion control. They put it in. Um, it's still, it's, it's not terrible because they have plants, it passes the turtle test and so forth, but you still wanna keep track of how much of the shoreline has that erosion control that's artificial and, and solid like that. Um, a quick question, you know, some of these complicated setups that you find on some lakes, would this be considered sloped or vertical? Um, you know, at the foot of the slope where it reaches the water, it's sloped rock and rip rack, but then there's vertical rock walls that create terraces upland of the riprap. So again, try the turtle test. Can a turtle make it to dry land along here? At least it sure can. It can make it to here, right? It can make it to here and then get up here and, and find its way. So it, it does, a turtle can get up out of the water. Maybe it lays its eggs in this little tiny spot right here, but it can get up onto the shoreline. So I would call this sloped. Um, Seawall or riprap. Another way of asking yourself, is this vertical or is it sloped? Um, even though there's some rocks down here at the base, they don't come close to the top of the seawall. Um, it's vertical. Turtle couldn't pass this test. Again, this one might be a little tricky. It's potentially sloped because you have this riprap, even though it is up against the, the seawall that's vertical. Um, back in here, the turtle might be able to make this hop, <laughs> but I don't know. I'm, I'm getting more skeptical about this the more, the more I look at this picture. Um, you'd have to make your own judgment call on this one if they've done enough to add enough slope here to actually connect the lake to the, to the land. Um, you'll have to decide from what you see out on the lake. All right, the final category of erosion control is bioengineering. So using soft engineering or natural materials other than rock, you know, biological materials to um, control erosion. So this is an example of core logs. These are made of coconut fibers or other, you know, organic material that will eventually break down once the plants that are planted in it get established. So, um, it's, it's, this is the, um, the kind of bioengineering example. Um, and one thing you might note, if you look at the data sheet, you know, you always, you may, if you're into natural shorelines, you may have heard us talk about the value of natural erosion control and, and using biological materials. So you might wonder, why do you get a negative score for using natural materials? It's negative because even though erosion is being, erosion is being dealt with, but it's less negative than the artificial structures. You know, vertical seawalls lose a lot more points than a few core logs would do. So, you know, that's something that um, you should keep in mind when you're interpreting those scores. Here's another example, kind of a zoomed in look at the core logs. If you haven't seen any of these in place before, you can see that they've been kind of staked in and this natural material will, will break down after a while. They've also planted a lot of you know, native deep rooted plants in here that will eventually take over the job of um, controlling erosion by the function of their roots. All right, here's another example. Um, sometimes these core logs are installed along great lengths of shoreline. This was actually a municipal project to stop erosion on a lake. And here's that photo again of the home that where they um, have the, we said, oh, look, they have uh, woody debris, woody habitat in their lake. Well, they also are using them as, as bioengineering so erosion control. So um, you can include it in your assessment of, of erosion control as well. 
And then we get some weird stuff. What about a, a, a spot like this? Um, they've thrown in some cinder blocks and some concrete pieces. Um, they have let some, let some plants grow. We have a little uh, unmowed vegetation um, strip, which is great. Um, I think a turtle could clear it. I would call this sloped artificial in terms of the erosion control question. This one, um, I think it's uh, railroad ties that have been put in place, have not stayed in place very well. I would probably end up calling this vertical artificial. It's pretty vertical from what I can see here. Good thing they have the cone there for safety. You don't want anybody to fall off the, uh, the sad little seawall there. All right, that's the end of the photos. I just wanna wrap up really quickly um, with what to do once you have all this information. Taking useful photos is really helpful. You know, go crazy with the photos when you're out there. That'll really help you document um, the, the observations that you make, make really interesting comparisons to the future. Um, you can upload photos into the MyCore Data Exchange, the MDE, when you submit your data. Um, you can only upload three photos per section. So the, if you take more than that, those are for your reference. You won't be able to send them to us and that's fine. Um, blurry photos won't do you or us any good. So you don't need to keep those. Um, and it's very important to label the photos with a section number. Um, so you know where those photos are from later. So you can you could do the section number, you could do coordinates. Um, you know, I find it really useful to carry a small dry erase board with me in the boat. And then I could write on it what the photo is of and like hold it up in the photo or take a photo of it and then take the photos just so you know where you were when you took those photos. Because after a while, all the shoreline is going to start to look the same. We want you to enter your data into the MyCore Data Exchange um, and the website will walk you through that. Um, at this point, it's important to not to, to leave your um, browser open, the website open when you're entering the data, even if you have to take a break, don't turn off your computer, don't close your laptop um, because if you go back, it'll think you're entering data for an entirely different link and we don't want that. So you wanna do it all at once. And of course, be sure to save a copy of all the information for yourself. Um, and then send the complete report to us. You can either mail copies to us or you can make them into a PDF, scan them, take a photo, however you get those to us. It's important for us to actually have copies of your data sheets. Um, and the information on where to send them will be on the data form itself. So we should get the survey cover sheet, all of your data forms, one for each section, a map that shows where all your sections are, and again, um, don't mail us photographs. You don't have to do that, but you can put them in the data exchange for us. But we, won't, we don't wanna keep a bunch of hard copies of photographs. Um, I'm gonna end with a real quick um, uh, data, one, one data slide for you that shows one of the interesting observations we have made after multiple years of volunteers um, conducting Score of the Shore. And this compares along the bottom here is the number of, um, houses and major buildings along a shoreline um, for every 1,000 feet from zero buildings to 80 buildings in a thousand foot section um, compared to the score, the shore, score, the shore score they got. So a really bad score or hundred percent, a really good score. It shouldn't surprise you that what this is showing you is that fewer buildings means a higher score. Not a surprise, right? But it's kind of interesting how quickly that changes with just a few buildings, you know, maybe five along here. See how the score starts to drop. And by the time you have 20 houses or other buildings like garages and boat houses and that kind of thing along a thousand foot section, you're already down to a score of about 50 out of 100. So, um, you know, obviously our activity is what's causing the drop in the score. So we're, we're, keeping, we're keeping an eye on this and we're learning a lot from, from the other bits of data that come through this whole um, survey. And that's my last slide. So now it's time for questions. Eric, do we have any? We do. Thank you, Joe. Um, there's a few uh, questions. Some are for the protocol and some are broader towards shorelines. Just due to time, I'm going to first look at the, the protocol questions. And then if we have time, dig into the others. Mm -hmm. Okay. When your data is based on arbitrary thousand foot sections, doesn't it obscure significant differences in shoreline management? For example, one property owner might have a seawall and his neighbor a natural shoreline, but they are scored together. 
Yeah, I love that question because it gets into why we did it the way we did when we created this protocol. And one of the reasons we did it in thousand foot sections is because we're not interested in asking volunteers to go judge their neighbors individually. You can imagine that that might cause some conflict on the lake. Nobody likes to be told they're doing something wrong um, or have someone outside their house with a clipboard, you know, scowling and writing down angry comments about their shoreline, right? So we definitely do it on a broader case, um, a way of looking at it from a broader perspective. So yes, it's not meant to compare one homeowner to the next. It's meant to look at the lake as a whole and to identify those parts of the lake where improvements could be done it'll be obvious to you where in that thousand foot section, the problems are happening. And you can certainly use that. But um, if people are interested in knowing how an individual property would score, that's that shoreline stewards um, uh, um, survey that an individual property owner can do online that I referred to at the beginning of the presentation. Perfect, thank you. Okay, this is in regards to chemical treatments. So for lakes with annual chemical treatment of invasives, but also bare spots that may be natural, which places would you note as having major management? We do have access to past treatment mats if these would be helpful. It will be helpful, right? Because you'll know where um, herbicides have been applied. Because certainly not every lake has natural plant growth all over it. Sometimes it's just bare naturally. And so those plants have not been managed. So what you want to do is use your the best information you have access to. And not everybody has access to everything. And maybe you'll just have to make your best guess. But if maybe you have a section where, you know, plants never grow here, it's not because we spray them or harvest them, they just never do, um, then you certainly wouldn't say, oh, there's management happening here, right? So it's based on whatever information you have. So if you have those treatment maps, that'll definitely help you answer those questions. And I think just if you could speak a little bit, this is the same person in regards to CARA. What guidelines can you provide for scoring CARA? It grows much sparser than other submerged vegetation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, there's certain aquatic plants that don't grow in a dense bed. They'll be like here and there. Um, and that's okay. It's still there because what you're going to be doing is thinking about that whole thousand foot section. And if so, if there is plants growing up and it's sparse, they're still growing there. And so I would still say there is submerged vegetation in that area. Um, you don't need, remember, that's one of the benefits actually of doing it at the thousand foot scale. Um, if there's a foot or two between plants, you don't have to, you don't have to try and study them down to that scale. You just look down, you look down from the boat and you go, oh yeah, there's plants growing here. Even if you can see some, some sediment in between them. Excellent. Uh, it is 301. So I know people might need to stretch their legs uh, a little bit after a couple uh, presentations, but uh, Joe, are you okay with answering a couple more? Yeah, I can do a couple more. And then as we transition to exotic plant watch, I know you're the first presenter, so I can also hop into the chat and type in some answers to some additional questions. Perfect. But yes, so folks feel free to take a break and uh, be back at 315 for the exotic aquatic plant watch. Uh, for our final presentation. Okay, um, is there a program that is interactive with Google or other map programs to allow plotting of score the shore date, data or locating invasive species like purple loosestrife on the shoreline, for example? Uh, well, yes, um, and I'm trying to think about you know, something that would be accessible to most. So you mentioned Google Maps. Um, there's a, a function inside Google Maps is basically called My Maps um, that you can um, do a lot of things more than, more than you would realize until you dig into it, um, where you can mark locations of just about anything with an easy click and you can add information about that location. So you could... Um, color different points. If there's things, oh, this is where I saw purple loosestrife. If you have those coordinates, or if you just know and can click on that map on your screen, you can then type in information in your Google map about what you saw at that location. This, and that can be data, descriptions, whatever you want. Um, you can also do, you, you might remember the map that I showed you that had the blue and yellow sections all around. That was made in Google Maps where you can draw lines, you can give them colors, that kind of thing. So if that's what you're thinking of, um, it's actually pretty powerful um, how much information you can share. And those are also are put into a map and then you can share it um, by a, with a simple link that the Google map will provide you if you wanted to share that map with other people, you know, in an email or, or um, you know, text them your map if you want to. 
Okay. So there's a few who have come in here. Um, and this is, uh, if you want to talk a little bit about our data exchange, it looks like that. So is mm -hmm. there a list of public lakes on which volunteers collect data on the website? Do you bet. They, yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. So um, in the MyCore data exchange, if you go in there um, on our website, so Tamara has shown, a couple of us have shown it, um, go to mycore.net, click on data exchange. Um, there's an option to view data. So if you go in there, you can do searches by a number of ways. And one of them is just to look at all lakes. Um, and you can see um, the names of the lakes that have collected data, the actual measurements that they made. You can go and see all the score the shore results. Um, we actually, you know, for the, some of the plant parameters, we scan all the maps and everything and the photos of plants, we put those in there. So yeah, you can definitely go in there. You can search by certain date ranges if you want. You can search by county, lake name, or just look at everything. Um, you can also download that into a file that you can have on your own computer if you really want to get into it. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll Tamara answer this a little bit, but I'll just add a little bit more. If, if we all agree that, and Joe, feel free if you want to as well. If we all agree that hardened shorelines contribute to lakes ecological habitat degradation, why does Eagle give liberal permits for it to occur? while at the same time also make it difficult to do natural shoreline protection. And so uh, Tamara uh, put in there that this is a good conversation to have with the permitters because um, they have all that insight. So feel free to reach out to your local land water uh, interface permitting staff uh, and Tamara gave the link to that. And then also I'll just add, this is a complicated manner of, and it's a, uh, this, the shoreline is a blending of a lake which is held in public trust and private property. And so there's a lot of uh, give and take there and it's, it's a complicated matter. Now uh, things are changing and things have changed where um, best practices have to be uh, brought in to um, hardening your shoreline. So if you want to reinstall a, a seawall, you now do have to have some best practices, best practices implemented in there. And then I would say that it is quite easy to do a natural shoreline uh, it does require a permit because we want to make sure it's done correctly, um, but uh, it's a cheap and fast permit to get to put in a bioengineered natural shoreline. Can I add one other comment on that? Or sure. Great. So great answers. Super excellent information and a lot of what I was thinking. The other thing that I'll, I'll just mention really quickly is that it can be easy to become frustrated when you see something happening on your lake. And you find out that it was permitted and, you know, you, you want to get angry at Eagle or whatever for, for permitting that. Um, but I think there's also some benefit to um, not just sitting there and hoping that the agencies do what you want them to do. Um, I think communities can have a pretty, pretty strong influence on what people do around their lakes. And often what happens when you do see seawalls going in, a lot of times people don't know there are alternatives. And so I think there's definitely opportunities for education. Um, people might see an advertisement for a really tidy looking seawall and they with a beautiful patio and a grill and this is the lakefront I want. Um, and sometimes the natural shorelines and the healthier shorelines don't get as much as much press, as much playtime as, as some of these more uh, manicured ones do. And so, you know, if, if information is not being shared around your lake community about natural shorelines, um, maybe think about how that can change so people know that those alternatives are out there. Because I think I see a lot more, you know, people actually think they're pretty cool once they learn about them a lot of times. And if a few people on the lake have gone natural with their shorelines and those folks show their neighbors how, how much they enjoy that and the birds they hear and the frogs that hop around and the better fishing they have off their dock compared to other neighbors that have unnatural shorelines. Um, people, people do start to get swayed sometimes. So it's, it's worth thinking about that too.